Hello, fourth graders. It's Mrs. Caldwell here, and today I'm going to be reading a story called A Desert Scrapbook, Dawn to Dust in the Sonoran Desert by Virginia Wright Frierson. We are going to be looking at how she writes, and we're going to pick out some things that she does when she is writing um, so we can use them when we do our own writing. All right. The sun is just coming up over the distant mountains. I packed up my painting gear. Watercolors, check. Paper, check. Water bottle, check. Brush plus pencil, check. Hat, check. Folding chair, check. Now I must hurry outside to sketch some birds and animals while they are active in the cool early hours. This summer day promises to be another scorcher. I find a beautiful view and sit quietly, listening and waiting for the animals to get used to my presence. Some people think that our Sonoran Desert is just a dry land of mountains, strange plants, and great sweeping skies. But look very carefully and you will also see many interesting creatures. Once on a spring day, when I was out painting a prickly pear cactus, a desert tortoise crept up to nibble on a ripe fruit. I quickly sketched it until it crawled away with a red-stained mouth. Prickly pear blossom, May. Another time, when I was painting wildflowers, I noticed that a shadow kept passing over my white paper. When I looked up, I was surprised to see a vulture circling right above me. It was so close, I could see its wrinkled head and the sunlight through its large wings. It flew off as soon as I waved my arms to show I was not dead, and it would not be eating me for lunch. Today, I sketched some doves. I'm startled by a roadrunner bursting from behind a nearby cactus. Today, as I sketch some doves, I am startled by a roadrunner bursting from behind a nearby barrel cactus. It catches a zebra-tailed lizard and dashes off, leaving a little cloud of dust. Barrel cactus bloom, August, my favorite cactus flower. A cactus wren emerges from its nest of twigs and dry grasses and a jumping choa. I saw I draw my studies of the nest and the mother wren as she flies back and forth with beetle larvae for her babies. And then up here we have cactus wren feather and cactus wrens. So it's really cool because she's using this and showing us her um, what she saw like it's a scrapbook. The sun is getting higher and the day is getting hotter. Most of the animals are now rested in cooler, shady places to escape from the broiling heat. They will not come out until the cool of the evening and the cover of the darkness. A tarantula waits until a nightfall in its cool underground tunnel. A desert pack rat is asleep, curled up deep inside its messy mound of cactus joints, sticks, leaves, bark, and rocks. A desert scorpion hides under a rock, its babies clustered safely on its back. A black-tailed rabbit rests in the shallow hole it has dug in the shade of a mesquite tree. An elf owl sleeps in a hole in a saguaro. A kangaroo rat lies asleep, curled up all day in its deep burrow. They never need to drink water, but get all the moisture they need from seeds and plants gathered at night. A western diamondback rattlesnake stays cool in the abandoned hole of an antelope squirrel. Swagero flowers, May. 
The creamy white flowers of the sueros have finished blooming in this year, and now the fruit begins to ripen. It's feasted upon by many desert animals, insects, and birds. The Ihila woodpecker has a nest in the hole it has pecked in the giant cactus. Ihila woodpecker, fe woodpecker feathers. And so it's telling me how to say it correctly, right here and right here. It's the pronunciation. I rest in the shade of a Palo Verde tree and look at some seeds and pods I've collected. Above me, a curved billed thrasher cools itself by wildly opening its beak. This small saguaro is about 25 years old. Wow. Palo Verde pods, jojoba nut, cresote brush, bush, cat claw, asia, devil claws before the pod opens, saguaro fruit, prickly pear fruit, desert willow pod, and misquit beans. And so this right here, she's showing you, she drew a bunch of pictures of the things that she saw and she labeled them. This story happened a few years ago. I was sitting on a hot ground painting a mountain view when I noticed a slight movement under a bush. A bush. My eyes focused on a huge rattlesnake, coiled and perfectly camouflaged next to my foot. I eased back and trembled as the snake slowly moved away. I saw a large lump in its middle. Luckily for me, it must have eaten a cottontail. So she, right there, she's telling us um, a story. So she's not, she's describing something that she went through when she was out um, drawing or painting. Thunder grumbles in the distance, and I notice that the air is heavier. Maybe today will bring the first rain of the summer moonsons. The dry stalks of the acotillo waving in the hot wind, welcoming the coming storm. I head from my home, looking down as I always do when I walk in the desert, careful not to brush against this spiny cactus or twist an ankle on a loose rock. I drink cool lemonade in my studio, which is an old water tower at the house. The long-awaited rain begins to pour from the clouds, drenching the parched ground. The shallow roots of the saguaros drink up the precious moisture. The cacti will begin to swell with the water they must store through the long droughts. With a great crashing of thunder, lightning strikes the tallest saguaro in the mountain. It will collapse and its skeleton will stand with the wooden ribs reaching the sky like fingers, but the fallen cactus will provide shelter and food for many insects and small animals. Now this is a page with a bunch of different things that she has um, drawn that she's seen in the desert. I stay inside until the storm passes, carefully sorting some of the cactus spines I've collected. So these are her cactus spines that she's collected. I try to remember some of the patterns I've seen in the desert. Here's all the patterns she remembers seeing in the desert. Here's some more. Before, I love to come outside right after a rain has freshened the air and settled the dust. I walk into the dry ario near my house and hear a roaring sound. After, suddenly the aurora is filled with churning water. So much rain falls in such a short time, it cannot all soak into the baked earth. The water collects in many steam stream beds in the mountains and becomes a muddy, roaring flash flood in the valleys. Don't ever camp in an aurora. So you can see there's no water. Now there is a bunch of water. 
By the evening, the, spare, the spadefoot toads that have been buried deep underground all year have dug up to the surface. They croak and sing and lay eggs in the muddy pools. The eggs must develop into tadpoles and then baby toads before the puddles dry up in a few days. The toads eat many insects in their few days above ground. Then they dig back underground for almost a year to await another rainy season. Once I saw several garter snakes feasting on a spadefoot tadpole in a puddle. So she drew a picture of it. This group trampled all the tomato plants in my garden last night. I sit unseen in the rocks and sketch a herd of javelinas as they eat prickly pear pads and saguaro fruits. They leave a strong musky scent in the air and deep prints in the soft mud for their small hooves. There is always a glorious sunset after a rainstorm. The pungent smell of the desert creosote brush perfumes the air. I sit on the rocks with my watercolors, trying to capture the warm glowing light and the fiery colors. The desert sky grows dark as I return home. A great horned owl sweeps soundlessly above my head. The air fills with sounds of life after night falls in the desert. Nocturnal creatures creep out of their tunnels and burrows. I hear an elf owl calling from its hole in a saguaro. The toads croak and sing, coyotes yip and howl. In the studio, I spread out my sketches of these Sonoran desert plants and animals and the fe feathers, spines, and seeds I have found. I think maybe I will collect today's work into a scrapbook that will give a feeling of this desert day from dawn to dusk. Outside my tower window, thousands of bright stars pierce the immense blackness of the beautiful night sky. What a great book. And I wanted to end this video with showing how incredibly descriptive our author was right here um, and, and a lot of the book. When we're writing, we need to be very descriptive. And right here, she's saying the stars are piercing the immense, which is the big blackness of the beautiful night sky. When we write, we are going to need to make sure that we are very descriptive in what we are talking about. All right, I will see you next time. Thank you for coming.